Good morning. Welcome back to the Retirement Report. I'm Hank Parrott, your host. You know, we've been throwing all the things around today. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about estate planning, the five essential documents. We're going to get into IRAs and, and the importance of understanding that tax law changed a bit ago. And uh, well, I say tax law, but basically the laws change with regard to asset protection features within uh, retirement accounts. And we're going to talk about that and how you can, uh, if you have, and this is one really important area to understand. It's been a, from a, I think mm -hmm. about three years ago, I guess, yeah. it's changed. So we want to make sure that you're going to be protected as far as your, you know, with regard to your IRAs and your and your company plans. One of the things, by the way, when it comes to estate planning, again, it's a very, you know, this is it for each individual. It's going to be different. I talk about five essential documents in a general sense, but when you break those down, and most people, most people, again, very clear, <laughs> can benefit from the five essential documents from having a trust over will, I believe. But that doesn't mean everyone uh, needs to do that. And this is where understanding what's best for you, and then if you get into even the five essential documents. For those of the majority that would benefit from that, it's still how those are set up and how it's done for your specific situation to make sure that your wishes and your family are protected and taken care of. So if you would like to get a specific plan for the first 10 callers to my office this morning at 615-376-5325, Tess is standing by. She'll get your information. She's got a little packet she'll send to you, uh, a checklist of things to bring to your appointment with me. And what we'll do, working with Russ, we can set up for you as a part of the whole comprehensive financial plan that we do would be estate planning. So we can set up an appointment where Russ will come to my office to meet with us together, or we can meet at his office, either one. Uh, and this is the benefit that uh, Russ has given to you as well. Normally, it's how much for a consultation? $375. $375 to meet with him in consultation. If you're one of the first 10 callers, you'd be able to get that at no cost. 615-376-5325. Tess is standing by to get your information, send that out to you, a checklist of things to bring to your appointment, uh, including your estate planning documents for a review of those documents and to make sure, in fact, that they're going to do for you what you want. Or I, so many people come in to see me that don't have anything done. They don't have a will. They don't have powers of attorney. They don't have trust. Well, this might be a great time for you to get that handled, okay? Let's get it done for the giving season of Christmas. How's that? 615-376-5325. Tess will get, to, get your information, get that out to you. And when you come to see me, I'll give you a free copy of my book, Seven Steps to Financial Freedom and Retirement. All right, and again, on the planning part of this, I want to emphasize this isn't just a consultation with Russ. You're going to get to meet with him, and you get, and we'll set out the planning, and he'll, you'll be able to see what he, you know, the kind of work he can do for you, what uh, would be best in your situation specifically. Uh, again, a review of your documents, maybe to see if uh, they're going to do what you want them to. The language in your documents, I can't stress. You think, oh, I got a will, I'm all set, or I got a trust, and I'm all set. Well. Not necessarily. The language may not, in fact, be doing. I, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at documents and, Russ, and sent them over to you for that matter as well. And we're like, uh, no, that's not going to do. <laughs> you said it was going to do this. No. Uh, did you know your, your, uh, for a member once with a couple, that the children were actually, when the, when the first died, the children would be in charge instead mm -hmm. of the surviving spouse. Mm -hmm. Not a good plan, and they had no idea that was in there. It's how that miscommunication got there with the attorney that set them up, who knows. But this is one of the areas. You want to review your documents and make sure that they're going to do what you want or to get them improved or to amend them or to get them updated. Good time to do it, all right? All right, we're going to, and oh, by the way, comprehensive plan. It means it's not just one visit. If it's two or three visits even, to make sure that we get a plan set up for you, investment analysis, talk to you about Social Security, Medicare, uh, f of course, your finances, show you what your financial future is going to look like based on what you're doing and ways to improve it. All of that is a part of the planning, okay? So again, be one of those first 10 callers, and we'll get that offer out to you one more time during the show, or at least one more time. All right, we got a caller. Let me get this there. Here we go. This is Denise. Denise, welcome to the Retirement Report. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I have a few questions. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to know, once you have like your living will mm -hmm. and your power of attorney safe for health, now, should those documents be submitted to your doctor's office that have on file, or where should you store these type of documents. So that's one. Okay. The second question is, in terms of your um, your trust, your living trust, is it a good idea to have it changed over into like? Because I have, I'm, I'm having one put together, and I have um, ordered an EIN. 
but should I have that change to a nonprofit to avoid taxes on uh. that? Okay, we're gonna now that that you're getting into an advanced area with when you're talking about a trust with an EIN number, a separate, its own separate tax ID number, and comparing that with uh, depending on what your of course we're gonna get into this with your goals. Russ, I'll let you jump in with some questions on that one versus uh, setting up a, uh, a like a charitable. Um, did you say charitable trust or foundation? Well, it would be um, make it into like a nonprofit. To nonprofit. Avoid taxes. That okay. 501, I guess, C3. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, I can talk in terms of the first one, and then we'll get to the second one in just yep. a minute. The, okay. um, the best thing to do with your health care power of attorney and living well, I think, is to give a copy to your doctor, your attending physician, so that they'll always have that on, on record. Uh, when you go into a hospital, I know typically they'll ask you if you have those documents, but they won't ask for actual copies at that time. They'll just note it on their charts that you do have these documents. So in the event that a condition does come up where you might need to have these documents used, they can maybe request them at that time. I like for you, the clients to have copies at their house. Uh, I don't necessarily like putting them in a lockbox because you can't get into lockboxes a lot of times and typically the family member that needs to act on those documents probably doesn't have access anyways. Um, so make sure that you have them at your home in a fireproof safe uh, where you can tell your kids or whoever the agent is that the, where it's located. But do make sure your, your attending physician does get a copy of those documents. Uh, secondly, on the trust, uh, I'm understanding the question to mean that you created a revocable trust, you went out and got an EIN, which is really not necessary for a revocable trust because during your life you're basically the trustee and beneficiary and therefore you can use your own social security number. But some people do get separate EINs, just know that you would file your tax returns the same way. Um, as far as converting it to a charitable trust, usually we do that and call it a private foundation. Um, that's kind of an advanced endeavor, and for clients, you know, they're doing that. Uh, they're going to be giving away their assets because a charitable foundation trust is irrevocable, and even though you can control it as trustee and control the distributions to charity you're not able to give the money back to you. So if you do set it up that way, just know the money you put in there is gonna be gone. Secondly, there's a lot of administrative expense associated with managing a private foundation trust. And a lot of times clients that aren't putting any more than half a million in there are probably not getting their money's worth. If you wanna set up a fund that you wanna benefit certain charities, and let's say you hadn't really made up your mind yet as to what those charities will be, or maybe scholarships or things like that, it's best to approach uh, uh, the Middle Tennessee Community Foundation, or I guess Fidelity has one, mm -hmm. where you Schwab. can set up Schwab. They, they allow you to set up these donor advised funds. They do all the paperwork. You don't have to set it up, you just, basically fund it and then in a lot of ways you can control the funds after they're put in and it's considered a tax deductible transaction when you put the money in even though you may not give the money to the charity right away so I would look in that direction first and then uh, understanding too the limitations when it comes to if now, well let me ask you Denise on the nonprofit is this something you're looking to uh, manage and operate uh, for the for and you've got charitable purpose involved with it a specific, something well, specific? Um, eventually the trust will be donated to, I have, you know, a um, institution that it will be donated to. Okay, so you want it to go, the, what you're looking to do, if I understand that, is you're talking about having it left to some type of charity or, or entity right. that you would set up. Uh, now, the, the difference between if you, if you want to do, in this situation, what, what would uh, maybe a charitable remainder trust, where you set up, a, as Russ said, you can do that through some existing entities or you can create your own and where you want it to go to the charities that you've named and you put money in and as Russ said, once you put that in, you can't take it back out, but you could get income from it. 
and you could have, and there could be some other tax advantages that could be had through your lifetime. Um, and so it could, it can be set up to structured where I'm going to put these assets here. I'm going to receive income for life. I might get some tax advantages with that income, and then when I'm gone, that's going to go to a charity. Is that kind of what you have in mind? Yes, but you mentioned. So, are you saying that if I were to set it up as a 501c3, I mm -hmm. would not be able to get any money out of it if I put everything in and, now? Well, nonprofit's going to be a totally different thing. Now you're setting up a business. Okay, so, okay, but I, I just wanted to know the the difference between mm -hmm. the type that would still allow me to withdraw money and the type that would not. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah actually. Um, some attorneys do refer to charitable remainder trusts as 5013C. It's a little misleading because we always think of a 501C3 as a separate organization. But if your attorney is setting up a charitable remainder trust, as Hank has described, then you will be able to receive distributions from it. And there are two different types. There's one that pays you a percentage mm -hmm. of the amount that you put in initially. It's an annuity trust, mm -hmm. and it's a flat amount that you get each year. And then there's others that pay a percentage of what the trust is worth each year. So those, those trusts can pay an adjusted amount depending on the return. And then your charitable deduction is based on uh, what the charity is planning to get at the end of your life if it's a charitable le uh, remainder trust for life. And there are a lot of rules associated with this. You have to calculate it in a way that the charity gets at least 10 percent uh, of the remainder interest. There's, there's some, so hopefully you're doing all of that, but if that's what you want, yes, that can be set up but you will be limited as to how much you can take out each year. You can't just go in and take out as much as you want. You'd be limited to whatever amount that the trust says you take out on a yearly basis uh, in the actual agreement. And there's going to be, there are IRS tables set up to determine what that dollar amount would be based on how much you're putting in and certain interest rates and that kind of thing. I have one more question. Sure. Um, would that remainder trust have to be uh, should it be under an EIN or can it just stay under my social security number? Oh, it would be irrevocable and so even though it is called a grantor trust, again we're getting into a lot of advanced terminology here, okay, yeah. it still would have a separate EIN. So, I see. Okay. Well, yep. thanks so much. You're welcome. Right. Thanks, Nice. Bye -bye. Good Bye -bye. questions. Those are those are very advanced. We're getting into it. advanced I love that. It. And we're going to carry that forward a little bit. We're going to talk about some, some other implications that came out of that with regard to taxes uh, and also uh, with regard to how you're, you know, again, being able to control the funds and not being, you know, to, to a limited degree. And of course, then you also uh, filing of tax returns. This goes into if you're setting up a separate entity that is going to have to file a separate tax return, you've got additional costs and other administration costs as well. So um, when you get into this kind of planning, it can be really good, but you've got to understand all the implications and make sure the amount, as Russ said, that you're putting in is going to warrant, you know, uh, being able to pay those expenses, that there's going to be enough of a value to, be, to that. All right, but what we're going to do, we're going to, when we come back, I know so much, when we come back, we'll dive into that a little bit more, try to break that out a little more into some, into, and, and I want to get into the IRA piece again and how that can work. And, it, and it, there's factors and other planning strategies that can be used with IRAs and charitable remainder trusts that could have some tax advantages too. So lots to cover. Join us here. We'll be right back on the Retirement Report. So that's nice.